Welcome to LOA Today. I'm Walt Thiessen here with Life Coach Cindy Chavez. Today is Wednesday. Happy Neville Day. It is Wednesday, June the 5th, 2019, 4 p.m. in New York, 1 p.m. in Los Angeles, 9 p.m. in London, and 6 a.m. in Sydney, Australia. But wherever you are in the world, thank you for joining us for another episode of LOA Today, your daily dose of happy. And I'm real happy that it's Neville Day because I get to talk with my friend Cindy. Hi, Cindy. How are you doing? Hello. I'm doing well. How are you doing? I'm doing really, really well, especially since it's Neville Day because Neville Day is always a fun day. That's right. where we, we do things on this episode, on the Wednesday episode, that are really different from the other episodes. I mean, even the Monday one. The Monday one, um, Louis D'Souza and I are talking about the book Illusions by Richard Bach, which is another book. But Neville is so much different from everybody <laughs> that's out there. It just feels like a different experience to me. So yeah. I'm it. Yeah, I look forward to it as well. And it it's funny. I've said this before, but... You know, I feel like we could read the same Neville book over. We could finish We could just start it over, and we'd find all these things that we didn't hit on this time because it's yeah. so, the material's so dense. So it's it's a lot of fun to go through a Neville book for the second or third time even because it's like new nuggets that you find, and I, I think it's a lot of fun. And, I, I have to be honest, too. I have to honestly say there are times where we're, we're reading a book, and I ask myself, didn't we read this in another book? It feels just like that other book. <laughs> well, I, and I think that is the case. I think especially with Neville because he, you know, Neville, we could use the word redundant and say that he, you know, teaches, but this is his message and he yeah. does teach it over and over. And one of the things that I figured out early on with my own practice and with my own writing and my own, you know, things I would cover in my blog and things I would talk about with clients is that, when you're in the space where you kind of eat and sleep and breathe this stuff, mm-hmm. you have to remember that that's not the case for other people all the time. And so things okay. that feel redundant to me, like, well, I already wrote about this or I already talked about this. Um, other people that may be reading are also reading a whole bunch of other things. And so it's, it doesn't sound so redundant to them. But for us, yeah. repetition is important for us to really get it, I think. No kidding. Yeah. Right? Repetition is huge. Well, it's partly why we always talk about law of attraction on this show because that repetition helps and we come at it from different angles every time, of course, but you know, still we're talking about the same thing and trying to learn the simplest concept in the world. I mean, being a deliberate creator, the simplest thing you could possibly do, except it's not so easy. <laughs> that's right. That's right. And so even, even some of us, you know, old pros who have been doing this a long time, we still have the forehead slap moments. Like, oh, yeah. <laughs> Every day. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Every day, right. So <laughs> so I think it's fun. And I hope we get some, you know, we've been uh, live streaming, which is fun and cool because mm-hmm. we're the Jetsons and we have all this great technology. And that's so right. <laughs> we'd love to have, you know, some conversations and some questions and, you know, that kind of activity as well because that's always fun. This so. is true. And, and we do have people who are tuning in. In fact, I need to do a shout out to one of them. Uh, Jeffrey has been one of our regular listeners. And Yay. he also, Jeffrey also had the nerve to it, you know, the actual daringness to audition for the oh. grassy screener. Yes. And he, and he made the first cut. Yay. He made the first cut. He's now in the callback section. So shout out to Jeffrey. Way to go for, you know, daring to yeah. do it. I mean, I've been kind of urging people to give it a shot, but he did it, and he actually got through to the second part, which is pretty cool. So I think it's great. I think it's great. That's how we make progress in life is that mm-hmm. we are willing to move forward and do something different, try yeah. something new. You know, sometimes things feel a little bit scary, and mm-hmm. um, but that's how we that's how we do it. That's how we make progress. Is to Absolutely. That step. I'm so happy to know that. That's that's excellent. Yeah. So way to go, Jeffrey. I'm making the first cut, Jeffrey. <laughs> And by the way, anyone else who uh, is interested, um, we're past the uh, um, the main portion of the auditioning process. But if you are among those who did apply and you haven't sent back your callback, today is the deadline. So you got to get in by midnight tonight. Um, and we do have a few people besides Jeffrey who listened to the show who actually applied. So, you know, don't wait. <laughs> this is it. I was going to say, you know, that um, – being in, in this kind of business, like I do a lot of things. I mean, any kind of thing you offer often has a deadline, right? right like, that's right. Last day to sign up for whatever. And, you know, there's always going to be people that sign up at the last minute because how you do anything is how you do everything. And 
Mm -hmm. People wait till the last minute. And so I'm imagining you wake up tomorrow with an inbox full of <laughs> Well, actually, people have been pretty good. Uh, of the group of people who we called back, you know, did the call back, as they call it, about half of them have already responded. So they, they've been responding in a good pace. So I don't have to deal with uh, all of them on, on the last day. Maybe half of them, <laughs> but I don't have to deal with all of them. So. Well, it's all good. It's a good project. I'm excited about it. You know. I am too. I think this is going to be, I don't know what's going to come out of this, but like you and I were talking about before the show, this is something, this is one of the first things I can think of in my life where I feel really excited about something that rationally, my rational mind tells me it's not a sure thing. And deep down, I think it's a sure thing. I've never experienced that before. And it's quite a feeling. It's really exciting. Well, we talk about it all the time, right? It's like we often get the cart before the horse and we think, well, if if I had this, I would feel this way mm -hmm. over here. And it's mm -hmm. like, no, go for the feeling first and then this thing will happen or whatever you need to feel that. And so I think you're doing that here. Yeah. And yeah. What's really remarkable, too, is, and, and this is a very important point, I think, when you're doing something that you really love and you get that feeling, you develop that feeling about the thing that you really love, it's incredibly easy. I mean, there's an effort. It doesn't even come into it. It's not even on the table. It just, it's there. And you just kind of, you know, milk it for all it's worth, but there is no effort at all. It's, it's an instant bleep. It's like, it's almost like it just grew up and, you know, sprouted overnight. Like, Oh, where did that come from? <laughs> <laughs> well, I was going to say, I know it's different for me. I'm sort of standing back as the observer. I'm not the one doing all the hard work. Uh, so it's easy for me to say, Oh, look how yeah, yeah. it's coming together. Right? <laughs> but I do have that sense, um, that it's come together in a really nice way, mm. very a nice way with a nice flow and everything seems to be just working out. So that's yeah. really great. Awesome. It is great. And um, I, I can't make any commentary yet about uh, who we're going to narrow the final list down to. Um, Cause obviously that wouldn't be fair. Plus we're still waiting for some of the entries to come in, but I can tell you, we have heard some uh, voices that really just knocked our socks off. So this decisions have not yet been made, but boy, there are some front runners and they are really good. <laughs> That's fantastic. Well, they you've got really the good. ear, you've got the great ear. So I'm sure that you had a part to play in, in being able to recognize that, but that's wonderful. I do, but I also have the benefit of, of working with both Alex, who has an acting background, by the way, and my sister, PJ, um, is going to be our director. And that may sound like nepotism. I guess in a sense it really is. But <laughs> truly, that's not why I brought her in, because she has a lot of directing experience. She did a lot of directing in the Washington, D.C. area in the 1980s and early 1990s. And she's a really good director. So I'm, I'm like psyched. <laughs> I'm so psyched to have those two on board and I'm letting them run the, the uh, casting process because they know that a whole lot better than I do. <laughs> I, I, I'm doing like the grunt work, right? I'm, I'm having all this <laughs> stuff and you know, sending out the emails and responding and putting stuff in the folders and all that kind of thing. <laughs> hey, it takes a, it takes everybody, right? It takes a village. It's teamwork. It really does. So before we get started with the book, I want to get our announcements out of the way. Um, first and foremost, of course, I think most of the people who listen are subscribers, but I have been able to determine that there are like 10, 15, maybe 20% who listen to every ep or, or any given episode who are not subscribers. So I'm talking to you guys right now. Become a subscriber. It's free. It doesn't cost you a thing. And you get all five episodes that we do every single week, Monday through Friday, coming right to your smartphone or whatever device you're using to listen to us automatically. And it's simple to do. You just go to the homepage of our website, LOAToday.net, and it will instruct you, based on the device that you're connecting with, how to become a subscriber. And, and in most cases, just click on this, and a few more clicks after that, and you're done. Really, really simple. And then, of course, once you subscribe, make sure that you share. Tell other people about it so they can get their daily doses of happy. And feel free to join us on the live stream, like Jeffrey and some others are doing right now. Um, because when you listen to us on the live stream, first of all, you can interact with us. You can comment to us. We'll include that in the show. Um, but also you get to watch us, which is kind of fun. I mean, podcasts, you only get to hear the audio, but when you get to see us on video, you get to see what we look like. And, you know, if you can scan my ugly mug, then it's actually fun. So, <laughs> <laughs> so become a subscriber to us on YouTube as well. Um, you could, the easiest way to do it is through one of the links in the descriptions of these podcast episodes that are out there. But if you can't find that, just go to YouTube and do a search on LOA Today podcast video and we'll pop up and then subscribe. And then after you subscribe, make sure you hit the little bell character next to it so you get notified. When you click that, that notifies you every time that we're going live or, or, or that we put up a recording on YouTube. So again, subscribe and share. And those are our messages for the day. Perfect. 
All right, I'm calling you out on the ugly mug comment because you're <laughs> talk there. Uh, every uh, once in a while, I, false modesty comes out. What can I say? <laughs> every probably every week, I'm telling some client about your experience with mirror work because oh yeah yeah. Right? Because it was so fantastic. Um, I mentioned mirror work to a client recently, and as I was beginning to talk about it, because I knew it was the thing, and I knew intuitively, I knew logically, just in every way, okay, this is what's needed. Mm -hmm. And as I was explaining it, I heard the person go, ugh. <laughs> and I said, I know that feeling. You just go, ugh. And they said, yeah. And I said, you know what that means, right? That means... This is the thing. <laughs> the yeah. So it's a it's a wonderful that I had the experience of of knowing your experience with mm. it. Yeah, um, it, it is tough at first. I mean, I won't mince words about it. The first <laughs> time that you do it is just plain excruciating. But the second time is a whole lot easier. All you have to do is for like three seconds the first time, so you did it. And then the second day, you do it for another five seconds. And yeah. after about three or four days, all of a sudden, for whatever reason, it just doesn't feel excruciating anymore. It, it feels like it's, it, I won't say it's normal, but it feels more comfortable yeah. for sure. Yeah. And, and that's, you know, I just tell people that right up front. I go, this is going to be probably going to be awful to begin with, and that's okay. Just yeah. keep going. It gets easier. It gets, it gets easier. Quickly. And, you know, when someone, I've had several people say to me, well, you know, I did that a few years ago and it did seem to help, but you know, and my, my, my self love got so much better and things did kind of turn around for me, but you know, I got, I got out of the habit of it and I stopped doing it. And I tell them, you know, if I were to start telling you about my relationship with my husband and I said this to you, well, you know, Five or six years ago, we used to tell each other we loved each other every day, but we don't really do that. <laughs> I <laughs> love it. You would immediately get a sense of, oh, well, things aren't right. Something's wrong, right? And I said, and so all we're talking about is uh, we're talking about a relationship. We're talking about your relationship with you, right? Yeah. And so I think that makes a really clear point that this is not something that we do for a few months and, okay, got that done. Graduated right. from that, got my certificate, now I can move on. This is a lifelong thing, your relationship with yourself. So, anyway. And I can also say, too, that after you've done it for a few months, and, by the way, after the first few days, it does get really, really easy. But after you've done it for a few months, if you keep going, it becomes such a part of your daily routine that you miss it if you don't do it. You really miss it. Like, I can feel it on those days that, wait a minute, something's wrong. Something's not right today. It just doesn't feel right. Oh, I forgot to do the mirror work. It, you, you missed it because you have a relationship and that's part of it in the same way you would miss your wife if she wasn't around or, you, right. would, you know, uh, the, your co-hosts or. Yeah, absolutely. Right? It's like, Oh, what's going on? So anyway, well, we're, we're on chapter five of this Neville book, chapter five. And the last chapter that we had had to do with, um, what were the words exactly? Because he uses these a lot. So controlled reverie. Controlled and, reverie was the title, yeah. Right? And talking about what we always say to each other, oh, <laughs> Neville's talking about meditation. I don't know what that is. <laughs> he talks about putting ourselves in a very relaxed state. It's almost like sleep, but not quite. He mm -hmm. often talks about that place that feels like it's in between awake and asleep. And so... This chapter, moving on from that, is called The Law of Thought Transmission. Mm -hmm. I remember last week when we were talking about, I mean, Neville was actually saying that when we think, and hes we're talking about prayer, the book is Prayer, the Art of Believing. And he's talking about when we pray for someone, um, when we think about them, when we imagine them having success, that we actually affect their thoughts and maybe their actions and the way they think of things. And so I, I think that's where he's still going here because the title of this chapter is the law of thought transmission. Mm -hmm. He starts out like he normally does grabbing a verse of scripture from the Christian Bible. He says he sent his word and healed them and delivered them from their destructions. And then his commentary he transmitted the consciousness of health and awoke its vibratory correlate 
in the one toward whom it was directed. Mm -hmm. Now, I think this is really interesting. If you're dealing with, um, and probably, unfortunately, we probably all can think of a friend or loved one that's dealing with some kind of illness. I hate to think of it that way, but Mm. if I have to think of it, I can think of a couple of people that I would like to see um, healing. And so when Neville talks about this, he talks about, you know, that when we transmit the consciousness of health, we awaken its vibratory correlate in the one we're praying for. Mm-hmm. I think that's like really powerful. Yeah. Because he's saying this vibration, the vibration of health, the consciousness of health is already there in them. <laughs> and by us transmitting those thoughts in their direction, we can wake that vibration up. That's pretty cool. It, it not only is cool, it's real. Cause I have a lot of experience having done exactly that. Yeah. It's pretty fun. I mean, it, it's not fun in the sense that you're dealing with people who are ill, often seriously ill. It's fun in the sense of, wow, look what we did. And it isn't just me. I mean, usually it's a small group of us all doing it together because we care about this one person. And the person rallies quickly, and we say, whoa, what was that? We did this on the podcast a few months ago. We did. That's right, yeah. We had a listener who said, I might not make it to listen to you because I'm going in for this procedure and it could be they're really nervous about it and it could be really awful and (laughs) we were like no no we're just going to hold that space for it to be better and and everything went well and yeah so okay so let's see neville says he mentally represented the subject to himself in a state of health and imagined he heard the subject confirm it for no word of god shall be void of power therefore hold fast the pattern of healthful words which thou has heard. So once again, this is from the last chapter. He's talking about us picturing in this situation, picturing someone healed and whole and not just picturing them healthy in a state of health, but hearing them tell us Mm. that they are in a state of health, hearing them affirm what we just imagined. Yes. And I love the way in the last chapter or the one before he talks about, um, and it's funny, we have to remember, this was written like back in the 40s, right? He talks about as if they were on the telephone. With you. Yes. <laughs> so I like this next paragraph a lot. Neville says to pray successfully, you must have clearly defined objectives. You must know what you want before you can ask for it. You must know what you want before you can feel that you have it. And prayer is the feeling of the fulfilled desire. Okay, so this goes back to what we've heard from Neville over and over for the past two years or so, right? Is that, and that is, he's instructed us over and over to assume the feeling of the wish fulfilled. Right. He's saying now that prayer is the feeling of the fulfilled desire. Doesn't that sound like it's basically the same thing? Is oh, yeah. The, so it's like when he tells us to assume the feeling of the wish fulfilled, he's instructing us to prayer mm-hmm. in his definition of what prayer is. And that's it. It's very specific what he means by prayer. Yeah. Right. And, you know, I love this that he says you must know what you want before you can ask for it. Because I find myself saying this to clients all the time. That is, you can't have what you want if you don't know what it is. Interesting thing, too, it doesn't have to be really, really specific what it is. You just have to know what it is. I mean, like, it could be as simple as, I want to feel better. I'm not sure exactly what's going to make me feel better, but I want to feel better. Yes, and the other thing is that so often when we ask someone what they want, they begin to tell us the how. Yes. (laughs) They begin to tell us their strategy of getting that thing, Mm -hmm. and it's like, for us to push past that and say, no, no, but what is it that you want? It doesn't matter how it comes to you. Mm -hmm. What is it that you want? And I love that you just said that. I want to feel better uh, because that's really all we ever want. This is true. (laughs) All All the other stuff is just a strategy to feel better. He says it does not matter what it is you seek in prayer or where it is or whom it concerns. You have nothing to do but convince yourself of the truth of that which you desire to see manifested. So this is what you were talking about earlier, that you're feeling it like it's a done deal. Yeah. Shockingly. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) 
I'm not kidding. It's really shocking. It's like, wait a minute, where did that come from? <laughs> you know, I, when people say like, you know that you know that you know, yeah, <laughs> right. It's this level of knowing that's so rock solid and. That is really exciting because when you start to feel that way, it's like it does. It feels like, well, it's a done deal. Like yeah. no one can convince you otherwise. And so he's talking about that here is that that's the only thing we have to do is just I, to convince ourselves of the truth. I, I start to feel sympathy for the various um, LOA gurus and so forth who know what it's like to just know, to just feel it, and then say to myself, say to themselves, Okay, how do I teach that? <laughs> because I don't know how you would teach that. I mean, I like the tools that we use. We talk about some good stuff. People have come up with great concepts. Abraham has great concepts. Neville has great concepts. There are a lot of great concepts out there. But when I just sit here and, and sit with the fact that I have this feeling that is so, so sure and so strong, I'm not sure how I would teach that. That's hard. How do you do that? Well, I think that you go to what, you go to something that we all do know. Right. Yeah. Like about ourself, about the world. Um, like no one can convince me that I'm a man. Mm -hmm. Okay. Because I know I'm a woman. Mm -hmm. No one can convince me that the sun is, you know, shining and there's no rain right now because I'm mm -hmm. watching it pour down. Mm -hmm. So there are things that we know that are really solid. And you know what? Sometimes even those things that we think are really solid, we figure out they're not. But, well, that's the cool part about being alive in this world. <laughs> right? But the thing is, is that it's not to prove whether you are right about something as much as it is to, to know the feeling. Mm -hmm. Recognize the yes. feeling of being sure about something. I know my name is Cindy. Mm -hmm. Right? Have you ever seen, um, like, any of the muscle testing methods? Oh, yeah. Right? And you know how you always start with a true statement? Mm -hmm. like if I say my name is James, I'm going to fail at that muscle test because mm -hmm. my name is Cindy. Right. Um, I can say when I was born, my parents named me Cynthia. That's a true statement as well. Mm -hmm. um, but there are certain true statements that we make that we just, we know that we know that we know that they're true. Mm -hmm. That's, it's that feeling. It's yes. recognizing what that certainty feels like. And then right away, you know, when you're dealing with something else, yeah, no, I don't have that level of certainty about this yet. That's I still true. have some doubt. I still have some. And in your situation with this, like you're saying it's shocking, right? So you're admitting that, wow, I'm, I'm surprised by this, but I still have this certainty. Yeah. So you yeah. have the certainty and you know what that feels like. And I think that's the only way you can teach it. I mean, maybe there's another way. All I can say is you've just demonstrated very effectively why it is that you are the life coach and I am the podcast host. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, let's see what Neville says about this. Because he's, if he's telling us that this is the only thing we have to do is convince ourselves of the truth of that which we desire to see manifested, he says when you emerge from prayer, you no, you no longer seek, or you have, if you've prayed correctly, subconsciously assumed the reality of the state sought and by the law of reversibility, your subconscious must objectify that which it affirms. Now, when he talks about this, the law of reversibility, um, I, I coached someone this morning and when we dug down, what we really saw that they were after was freedom, mm. right? So they wanted certain things because they thought those things would give them freedom. Right. Mm -hmm. And one of the things, that's a money thing for sure. It's not always money, but there are several things that people will say when you ask them. When they say they want money, they want more money, they want a certain amount of money, they want to be financially secure or whatever. Security and freedom are two of the things that come up a lot, right? When you say, well, what would that do for you? You know, I want to win the Powerball. Well, what would that do for you to suddenly have more money than you've ever had? What would it do for you? And a lot of people say, I would feel secure. Mm. And a lot of people say, I would have freedom. Mm. Freedom to go where I want. Freedom to do the things I want. So what we often focus on or what I focus on with them as a coach is let's talk about what causes you to feel secure now. Or let's talk about freedom now. You might remember this. When we were first doing the podcast, I got an email from a young lady that was 
in high school and, and was upset because she felt like her parents didn't give her enough freedom. I do remember that, yes. And she wanted more freedom. And she wrote me this beautiful email. She was very, very bright and articulate in the email and sounded like a very responsible young person. You know, she didn't want to go off and get all crazy. She just felt like she needed a little more freedom. And one of the things that I worked with her about was recognizing the freedom she already had. Mm -hmm. Like it's easy. And I understand it. I understand it being a teenager and having a curfew and not being able to do certain things and always feeling like your parents are like not letting you do something. But I, I started asking her some questions, right? It's like, do you have the freedom to, I don't know, to wear what color shirt you want? Do you have the freedom to read the books you like? Do you have the freedom to choose what snack you want when you get home from school? You know, there are all these ways that freedom was actually there, yeah. just not recognized. This is what Neville's talking about with the law of reversibility. Start appreciating all the places you do have freedom. I'm I'm free to wear my hair the way I want it. I'm free to go to sleep at whatever time I want in the evening. I'm free to watch what I want on television. You know, I have all these areas of freedom. And the more we, what we focus on expands. Mm -hmm. So the more we focus on freedom, the more likely it is that that thing we think is going to give us more freedom, which might be money or it might be our parents letting us stay out later. Yep, sure. <laughs> we'll show up. So Neville's talking about this law of reversibility. If if more money will create freedom, then maybe the sense of freedom will create more money coming in. But I think it's also interesting, too, that you mentioned a little bit earlier on there that there is an association in many people's lines, minds rather between stability or safety and freedom. Like one supports the other. They're, it's almost part of that same dynamic reversibility. As long as I feel safe and stable, I'll be free. Right. So it's like that thing that you want. How do you get to that feeling of what you would feel like if you already had it? Mm -hmm. Neville's always talking about, right? Always. Yeah. yeah, that's true. So, so he says, if you've prayed correctly, assuming the reality of the state that you're seeking, that the law of reversibility is going to deliver. Mm -hmm. So he says you must have a conductor to transmit a force. You may employ a wire a jet of water, a current of air, a ray of light, or any intermediary whatsoever. The principle of the photophone or the transmission of the voice by light will help you to understand thought transmission or the sending of a word to heal another. There is a strong analogy between a spoken voice and a mental voice. To think is to speak low to speak is to think aloud. I often have this idea that, you know, you've heard me say it over and over, our words are powerful. Mm -hmm. And if we think something enough, it will eventually manifest out of our mouth. Right? Mm -hmm. you know, we'll eventually speak it. Right. So Neville says that to speak is to think aloud and to think is to speak low. Mm -hmm. He says the principle of the photophone is this. A ray of light is reflected by a mirror and projected to a receiver at a distant point. Back of the mirror is a mouthpiece. By speaking into the mouthpiece, you cause the mirror to vibrate. A vibrating mirror modifies the light reflected on it. The modified light has your speech to carry, not as speech, but as represented in its mechanical correlate. It reaches the distant station and impinges on a disc within the receiver. It causes the disc to vibrate according to the modification it undergoes, and it reproduces your voice. I, I have to interrupt here because the irony of this is just <laughs> astonishing to me. Many people may not recognize this connection until I, I draw for them, but they'll see what it, what it is as soon as I say it. Almost everybody has heard of fiber optics. Yes. Fiber optics is where you have a fiberglass uh, cable that transmits light through it. Right. And virtually all of the Internet now runs on fiber optics. Yes. So the entire Internet, including our conversation here that we're doing right. live streaming on Zoom, is by this process 
that Neville described approximately 70 years ago. Yes, correct. <laughs> Amazing, isn't it? It's just remarkable. It's amazing. So the idea of using light to project sound and vibration. Yeah. And when we go back into, now this is what gets really interesting because Neville is talking about always spiritual things. Mm-hmm. Right? He's talking about, he uses the, the Bible, different Bibles, several different Bibles he uses for his texts. He's always talking about spiritual things. And if you go back into almost every, maybe every single uh, spiritual and religious tradition, there is a dimension of light, right? We talk about we talk about the light in someone's eyes mm-hmm. as the life force within them. Yeah, sure. So this is really interesting that he's talking about the way our consciousness and our thought process is actually moving to produce something. Mm -hmm. I am the light of the world. I am. The knowledge that I exist is a light by means of which what passes in my mind is rendered visible. Memory, or my ability to mentally see what is objectively present, proves that my mind is a mirror, so sensitive a mirror that it can reflect a thought. The perception of an image in memory in no way differs as a visual act from the perception of my image in a mirror. The same principle of seeing is involved in both. Your consciousness is the light reflected on the mirror of your mind and projected in space to the one of whom you think. By mentally speaking to the subjective image in your mind, you cause the mirror of your mind to vibrate. Your vibrating mind modifies the light of consciousness reflected on it. The modified light of consciousness reaches the one toward whom it is directed and impinges on the mirror of his mind. It causes his mind to vibrate according to the modification it undergoes. Thus, it reproduces in him which was mentally affirmed by you. So Neville is likening prayer to the way we experience fiber optics. Exactly. <laughs> right? That's amazing. It is amazing. Yeah, that's amazing. It's remarkable. <laughs> he says, your beliefs, your fixed attitudes of mind, constantly modify your consciousness as it is reflected on the mirror of your mind. Your consciousness, modified by your beliefs, objectifies itself in the conditions of your world. We say this all the time, right? While we go to people, we say, they say, well, I don't know what I've been thinking of predominantly. And we go, well, look around. Look around you, right? (laughs) Uh, To change your world, you must first change your conception of it. To change a man, you must change your conception of him. You must first believe him to be the man you want him to be and mentally talk to him as though he were. All men are sufficiently sensitive to reproduce your beliefs of them. Therefore, if your word is not reproduced visibly in him toward whom it is sent, the cause is to be found in you, not in the subject. As soon as you believe in the truth of the state affirmed, results follow. Everyone can be transformed. Every thought can be transmitted. Every thought can be visibly embodied. Now, this brings to mind a story that Neville told in another book, and I'm hoping I get the story right. Uh, And I'm hoping it was Neville because I really thought. <laughs> but I remember a situation where someone talked about, I think, having a boss who was just, I mean, horrible is the way they would describe it to everyone, not nice to anyone, not kind to anyone, not respectful to anyone, and that they used these kind of techniques. And suddenly the boss never changed the way they act to everyone else, but changed how they acted towards them. Do you remember the story? Yeah, that's, like, that's not familiar. I don't know if that's Neville, but that does sound I'm familiar. not sure, but I thought, okay, that that we could change someone and that they would change completely and be different. Um, I don't know, but I do know that our experience of them could change. Oh, actually, I have experienced exactly what's told in that story. I, I have experienced it both in terms of Yes, the person behaved differently toward me, and I was able to transmit my thought. I didn't know I was doing this, but I was <laughs> able to transmit my thought to a coworker 
by basically teaching them what I did, even though I had no idea I was doing law of attraction. Awesome. <laughs> basically just explain to them what I was doing and they got the same experience out of it. But we were the only two in the office. <laughs> that's, that's fantastic. And so, this, and it, it was it a woman. Also, and this, this woman, she was actually somebody who was in there temporarily. She was like the assistant manager of this operation. It was a bank. Um, and she was really just very difficult to work with. She had kind of a, a chip on her shoulder. Um, and as a result, everybody that worked there, it was just kind of tough to work with her. But those of us who learned to just change the way we related to her, it was like, it, it was almost like a Jekyll and Hyde routine. Certain people she would just be nasty to, and other people she'd be really nice to. And people were like, what's going on with this? <laughs> <laughs> wow. Yeah. That's really interesting. And I, I, it all, you know, we, we deal with this in law of attraction. It's vibration. Mm -hmm. Neville's talking about vibration here. He's mm -hmm. talking literally about our, about light and about our thoughts and our voices causing this mirror to vibrate it's yeah. the same way we see fiber optics work. And so, I, I mean, to me, it seems that the reason why this is possible is because, remember, we're always talking about uh, like vibrations, and we're always talking about alignment. Mm -hmm. And when we're expecting someone to be mean and nasty to us, and we're, like, defensive, or we've got our armor on because we don't want this, and we're expecting it, you know, we're somehow aligning with that energy. Mm -hmm. But if we have had this experience and we're completely in a different level of vibration, then I just think there's no alignment there. So it just doesn't happen. There's no synchronicity of alignment. Right. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I always wonder from the other person's perspective, are they wondering why they can't be more aggressive? <laughs> <laughs> well, you never know. That's possible. <laughs> they go in the other room and say, Oh, why was I so nice to that person? <laughs> <laughs> oh, That's an interesting okay. way to piss somebody off. <laughs> right? So, so Neville says subjective words, subconscious assumptions, mm. awaken what they affirm. They are living and active and shall not return unto me void, but shall accomplish that which I please and shall prosper in the thing whereunto I sent them. He's talking about words. I like, I like the way he's doing it too, especially the way he, he did that in that session, subjective words. And they followed it up with subconscious assumptions. Mm -hmm. And that's really what's meant by the word word. You know, we think, of, we often think of words as being like these fixed things that have fixed meanings and, and you know, we all understand what the meaning is, but it's not true. It has to do with what we think inside. What, we, what, how do we associate that? What are our assumptions about what that word is? Right. Exactly. So, and that's a, it's an important point that you just made. Um, it's it's one of the things that most coaches know is that it's really important to clarify something, mm -hmm. right? So when a client says to us, "I feel you know," uh, and they say, oh, "I feel tired," what does "tired" mean to you, mm -hmm. right? Because believe it or not, it's really easy to just assume, well, I know what tired means. Yes, right. <laughs> but it may mean something completely different once they start explaining what they meant by that. And so that's what Neville's talking about here. And that's what you're talking about is that we all, we have words, but those words have definitions and meanings to us that line up with our core values, that line up with our beliefs. And a lot of that is subconscious. So subjective words, subconscious assumptions awaken what they affirm. And by the okay. way, one of those words that uh, often causes debate, not just in Neville circles, but general law of attraction circles, is the word want. Because the people will point out, for some people, the word want is a lack position. It's I don't have it. Right. I want it, I lack it, and therefore I am focusing on this, this thing that I don't have, and therefore I can't have it, and it won't come. Right. But the, it's like all of the words. It, it just depends on how you're feeling about that word. If you're feeling like it's already yours, then for you, want has a completely different meaning. But if, like most people say, if, if want for you is I don't have it, then that's the feeling it has. It, it's a different meaning. Everybody can have a different meaning for the same word. Right, and a different association. The easy yeah. way to, to think about this is that if one person talks about cold weather, they, that might seem like a dream come true to someone. Yes, someone right. Someone who loves the snow, someone who loves outdoor sports, someone who, right? For me, no way. I don't want that at all. 
I might talk about that it's 90 degrees here, and a lot of people are like, oh, poor Cindy, how could she? <laughs> I'm like, oh, I really like it, right? So we can't make, we make a lot of assumptions. We do. And we need to get clear about how we think about things, because like Neville said before, we can't have what we want unless we know what it is. That's right. So he says that our words, he's talking about words, uh, subjective words, he says they're endowed with the intelligence pertaining to their mission and will persist until the object of their existence is realized. They persist until they awaken the vibratory correlates of themselves within the one toward whom they are directed. But the moment the object of their creation is accomplished, they cease to be. The spoken word subjectively in quiet confidence will always awaken a corresponding state in the one in whom it was spoken. But the moment its task is accomplished, it ceases to be, permitting the one in whom the state is realized to remain in the consciousness of the state affirmed or to return to his former state. Mm. You were talking about this last week. We were talking about prayer and healing Mm -hmm. and the idea that, yes, they, you know, that that healing power gets awakened, but whether it stays awakened or not. And you were talking about, I think it was Wayne Dyer that yes. went to a healer and got healed of cancer, but then years later ended up dealing with cancer again. Yeah. I, I, actually, I think he had, I, I have to correct myself on what I said that, that week. He didn't die of cancer. He died of, a, like, a heart ailment, but it was immediately okay. after he got cured of cancer. So it made me okay. wonder, like, well, what happened to the cure? <laughs> right, right. So, and, and that's, I think, what Neville's talking about here is that, He's saying that the moment the task, the mission of that word, that word is sent out and it has a task to accomplish. It has a mission. Mm -hmm. And once it's accomplished, that word ceases to be. And then the one in whom that state was realized, maybe the state of health, they either remain in that state or they return to the former state. That's right. He says, whatever state has your attention holds your life. Now, this is real Abraham stuff here. (laughs) It is. It's both of them. It's a perfect overlap. (laughs) Therefore, to become attentive to a former state is to return to that condition. And he quotes this verse that says, remember not the former things, neither consider things of old. And, you know, when we've had a story in our life for a long time, Sometimes it's not so simple to let go of that old story, even when things change. No kidding. Keep telling that story. Yep. Um, I think I, I told a, a story about a client who gave me permission to talk about it, um, that the story was, I don't deal well with change. Mm-hmm. And we recognize, no, oh, this person's a master at dealing with change. <laughs> and so that old story was sticking around. Yeah. And that's what Neville's talking about here. He says, don't remember those things because whatever state has your attention, that's going to hold your life. Uh, I like noticing all the overlaps between the various teachers. I'm going to bring in another one right now. We just talked about Abraham and Neville very much on the same page. Third one, Richard Bach, the author of Illusions. Yes. Includes in his Messiah's handbook from that story, argue for your limitations and they're yours. <laughs> and we do that a lot. We certainly do. Right? Whenever someone says, well, you know, you could do this, that might work. And you go, yeah, but the yeah, buts. That's yeah. always, I'm going to argue for my limitations. Right? Yeah. I don't do change well. I don't do change well. I don't do change well. I don't... <laughs> All right. So Neville says nothing can be added to man for the whole of creation is already perfected in him. The kingdom of heaven is within you. Man can receive nothing except it be given him from heaven. Heaven is your subconscious. Not even a sunburn is given from without. (laughs) (laughs) I love it. That's so great. The rays without only awaken corresponding rays within. Were the burning rays not contained within man, all the concentrated rays in the universe could not burn him. Were the tones of health not contained within the consciousness of the one whom they are affirmed, they could not be vibrated by the word which is sent. You do not really give to another. You resurrect that which is asleep within him. The damsel is not dead, but sleepeth, he borrows from another story. Death is merely a sleeping and a forgetting. Age and decay are the sleep, not death, of youth and health. 
recognition of a state vibrates or awakens it. Distance, as it is cognized by your objective senses, does not exist for the subjective mind. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there thy hand shall lead me. Time and space are conditions of thought. The imagination can transcend them and move in a psychological time and space. I remember a story that Neville told about um, a military man who his family, he and his family were wanting him to get stationed, I think, in Florida or somewhere where there were beaches. Oh, yeah, I remember the story. Yes. They got the word came down and the station was not there. And the wife, I think it was the wife and the mother that they imagined themselves walking on a beach. Mm -hmm. They imagined what it would feel like to have their feet in the sand. And we've talked about this before, the whole idea of assuming the feeling. It doesn't have to be an emotion. Sometimes it's a physical feeling, like your hands on the rungs of the ladder. Yes. And he had them, they were feeling that sand on their bare feet. And those those, uh, orders got changed and they got stationed at the place that they wanted, which was near a beach. That, that was a Neville story, wasn't it? I'm pretty sure. It wasn't That was a Neville story. So, yeah. you know, talking about here that distance doesn't matter. I know he's talking about praying for people that may be physical distance away. He's mm-hmm. saying it doesn't matter. Although physically separated from a place by thousands of miles, you can mentally live in the distant place as though it were here. Your imagination can easily transform winter into summer. New York, into Florida, and so on. Mm -hmm. Whether the object of your desire be near or far, results will be the same. Subjectively, the object of your desire is never far off. Its intense nearness makes it remote from observation of the senses. It dwells in consciousness. And consciousness is closer than breathing and nearer than hands and feet. Consciousness is the one and only reality. All phenomena are formed of the same substance vibrating at different rates. Out of consciousness, I as man came. And to consciousness, I as man return. In consciousness, all states exist subjectively and are awakened to their objective existence by belief. The only thing that prevents us from making a successful subjective impression on one at a great distance or transforming there into here is our habit of regarding space as an obstacle. (laughs) A friend a thousand miles away is rooted in your consciousness through your fixed ideas of him. To think of him and represent him to yourself inwardly in the state you desire him to be, confident that this subjective image is as true as it were already objectified, awakens in him a corresponding state which he must objectify. The results will be as obvious as the cause was hidden. The subject will express the awakened state within him and remain unaware of the true cause of his action. Your illusion of free will is but ignorance of the causes which make you act. (laughs) Uh Uh-oh. That's quite a sentence. So, you, so Neville is telling us that um, there are a lot of things that act as causes uh, in the way we act <laughs> besides our free will. Mm-hmm. He is saying mm-hmm. it's an illusion. He says that prayers depend upon your attitude of mind for their success and not upon the attitude of the subject. The subject has no power to resist your controlled subjective ideas of him unless the state affirmed by you to be true of him is a state he is incapable of wishing as true of another. In that case, it returns to you, the sender, and will realize itself in you. Provided the idea is acceptable, success depends entirely on the operator, not upon the subject, who, like compass needles on their pivots, are quite indifferent as to what direction you choose to give them. If your fixed idea is not subjectively accepted by the one toward whom it is directed, it rebounds to you from whom it came. Who is he that will harm you if ye be followers of that which is good? I have been young, and now I am old, yet I have not seen the righteous forsaken, nor his seed begging bread. There shall no evil happen to the just. Nothing befalls us that is not of the nature of ourselves. Now, this is interesting to me, this last little bit. 
that nothing befalls us that is not of the nature of ourselves. And what he says prior, where he says that the subject, that's the person that we're praying for, the subject has no power to resist our, our prayer unless, unless that, that he is incapable of wishing this for another, of wishing as true of another. I think that's really interesting. Mm-hmm. It if, is interesting. We, if we kind of break it down, it sounds to me like what Neville's saying is that if I'm praying for healing for a person, but this person is not even capable of wanting someone else to be healed, then it's not going to happen. Yeah, that is what he's saying. Right? And when we think about the idea of what he says right here, nothing befalls us that's not of the nature of ourselves. And we think about the whole world being um, a big mirror Mm -hmm. of our relationship with ourself. If I'm the kind of person that I can't even wish for someone else to have success or to have healing or to have good fortune, um, then I probably can't wish it for myself either. And therefore, it's not going to be able to come my way because it's not in me. It's not in my nature. This whole section um, reminds me of something. Earlier on, he, he was talking about uh, moving psychologically in time and space and uh, how the only thing that prevents us from accepting that we are instantly in communication and sending information and so forth to somebody far, far away is because of our belief in space. And I, I want to comment on that because... It helps, first of all, to answer a question. The question being, why is this so difficult? Why is all this stuff so difficult? Right, and he said our belief in space as an obstacle. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and and I recognize that we do that. And and what I wanted to point to was something that most people have heard of, the the, uh, television series Star Trek. Every single episode started off with the exact same first line, space, the final frontier. (laughs) And that is... Exciting. That entices. That's like, whoa, yeah, exploring space and all that kind of thing. And the moment that we accept that is the moment that we accept what he was talking about. We think of space as an object. We think of it as this almost this impenetrable thing to kind of be explored and seek out what's in the cosmos and so forth. And the reason I mention that is it's actually a good thing. There's nothing wrong with that. It's not like there's something wrong with us that we are focused on this, this illusion of space and that illusion is what's blocking us from being able to recognize that we can instantly transfer our thought, you know, across the parsecs. It, you know, there, there's nothing wrong with having that there. And I hear this a lot in, in people who talk about Neville, actually. I hear it that, well, you, you can't, you, you, you've got to take yourself out of that externality. And yes, that is how you understand what's going on. But, you know, there's also value in being in that externality. We choose to go into the contrast. That's part of the contrast. Right. Yes. You know? So what I'm talking about is accepting it and saying, it's okay. Right. You know? And can you learn to transfer your thought over the cosmos? Sure you can. They are not mutually exclusive. It's not you have to choose between transferring your thought over the cosmos and accepting space, the final frontier. You can have both. <laughs> right. Well, it's that... It's that we believe, if we believe it's an obstacle to our work. Exactly. And so that's the key, is that understanding it's not an obstacle. We have space, we have time, we have distance. None of it has to be an obstacle. And it's fun. Let's be perfectly honest. That's one of the reasons we're here. (laughs) We're here to enjoy this crazy, wild ride that we're on here. It's fun. Well, I'm looking at what we've got, and I'm not sure we can finish up today, but but I do want to get into to the next paragraph at least. Okay, well, let's give it a it's shot. interesting about what he says here, um, coming right off of what we just talked about. He says, a person who directs a malicious thought to another will be injured by its rebound if he fails to get subconscious acceptance of the other. As you sow, so shall you reap. Furthermore, what you can wish and believe of another can be wished and believed of you. And you have no power to reject it if the one who desires it for you accepts it as true of you. 
The only power to reject a subjective word is to be incapable of wishing a similar state of another. To give, to give presupposes the ability to receive. So again, he's talking here, if, if anyone gets worried about this, right? <laughs> Malicious <laughs> thoughts directed towards someone. Mm-hmm. Um, it's not a good idea. No. But um, not for the reason my people might think. <laughs> and it, right. And it might just come back to you. So, mm-hmm. uh-huh. Any yeah. ideas that any, anything come up for you about these last few things we've Oh, discussed? well, that thought, God, is there any aspect of life where I don't maintain cognizance of that? I can't think of one. Um, yeah. politics, religion, uh, entertainment, the news, anything that you can think of that people get all, you know, fretted about and so forth. Inevitably, there's some kind of malicious thought that goes out there, and they think that somehow that malicious thought is going to censor or stop or block or harm or hurt or or make somebody wake up. And all they're really doing is they're bouncing it back to themselves. Right. I mean, he says here, you know, furthermore, what you can wish and believe of another can be wished and believed of you. Mm -hmm. And I think that's... That's the key right there is to, to recognize it's kind of the golden rule, right? To recognize that whatever we're sending out, you know, it's actually the way the golden rule should have been stated. <laughs> right. I, that's my opinion, but I, I think this is the way the golden rule should have been stated. It's not do unto others as you would have them do unto you. It's do unto others as you would have be done unto you. It's words, right. What, it's experience, would you like? what <laughs> experience would you like to have? That's what you should do. Right. It's recognized that whatever you're putting out, someone else can put out as well. You know, you're not in this by yourself. We're all in this together and we're all connected. And and, and it uh, it doesn't even matter what somebody else is doing. It's going to bounce back to you. Yeah. I mean, the the other person is just kind of like part of that mirror you're talking about. But, you know, they they could be a blank wall for all that matters. (laughs) It's still going to bounce back at you. (laughs) Yeah. I think that's probably my favorite idea and concept is that, the whole world is just a big mirror reflecting back, you know, my level of self-love and the thoughts that I have. We talked about this. Um, I talked about this with someone this week. The idea that whenever I hear someone say something um, where they're telling me someone else has a thought about them, like, well, this person just thinks that I'm whatever. Right? I always know, no, that's what you think. Mm-hmm. That's the story that you're telling. And you've told it so much that now you're hearing it come out of other people's mouths. And how amazing is that? Talk about being a, a, an unconscious creator in that case. <laughs> right. And so, But that's what's so wonderful about recognizing that we can create consciously. Yeah. Is looking back and realizing that we've created everything anyway. And now that mm-hmm. we can be conscious about it, think about how much better it can get. It just gets better and better. Right, and it does, and you keep doing it over and over again. You keep recognizing, it. you keep catching yourself, and I, oh, th- this is something else I wanted to bring up. I'm glad you mentioned this because it, it tied in a thought I had earlier in the week. I wanted to make sure I brought it up with you, so this is good <laughs> because this this fits in perfectly for what, from, about what you and I have talked about many times in the past. The fact is that we are all putting out stuff all the time and catching ourselves, and. Just like in meditation, meditation, we focus and then our mind gets distracted and we gently pull it back and gets distracted again and we gently pull it back. We're doing the same thing in life. Yes. All the time. Yes. It's the exact same exercise. Right. When I realized that it reaffirmed, from, and not just reaffirmed, it actually filled in the gaps for me. I had long thought that I was not good at meditation. I didn't realize I'd been doing it all my life, every waking moment of every day. Right? (laughs) Yeah, it's true. And all of these things that we learn, especially when we start talking about certain tools and certain methods and all of this within the conscious creation idea, is that it's all just like that. Mm -hmm. I remember telling somebody recently, uh, explaining to them how to pivot. Mm -hmm. And I said, you may have to do this a hundred times in a day. And I think they were like, what? I guess. (laughs) Because it needs to become second nature. And so you don't beat yourself up when you realize you're thinking about what you don't want. When you realize you're thinking about lack. When you realize you're thinking about, you know, whatever that thing is that you're trying to change. You just recognize 
just like you said, just like you do in meditation when you say, oh, my mind is wandering, bring it back and focus on my breath. Oh, my mind wandered again, bring it back. You say, oh, I'm thinking about what I don't want, pivot back. What is it I do want? Over and over and over until pretty soon you're having much bigger gaps. <laughs> yes. Right? Yeah. I, I, the way I would express it is, and this is kind of a funny way to say it is, the more oops I can have in a day, the better my day is. <laughs> because every time that I consciously thought to say, oops, I'm bringing my mind back gently. That's right. That's right. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> I well, love we that. didn't make it through the whole chapter, but we'll come back next week and finish That's all right. Time. Hey, that's what a lot of the, the good stuff in Neville is when we take time to just go through a, a really deep chapter like this. So I'm, I'm okay with that. That's great. Perfect. Before we do go, though, I want to make sure you have the opportunity to tell people how to reach out to Cindy Chavez, the life coach, because if they haven't figured out from this episode that you're a great life coach, they never will. <laughs> <laughs> well, you can find me online at CindyChavez.com. It's C-I-N-D-I-E-C-H-A-V-E-Z. There's a contact form on my website, or you can email me at Cindy at CindyChavez.com, or find me on Facebook or Twitter, or lots of ways to find me. And I hope you do. I hope you reach out. Give us a shout. Say hello. Follow our YouTube channel. Make a comment. You know, <laughs> give us a shout out wherever. It's fun whenever we get that kind of contact, right? I mean, don't, whenever you see a message like that that you know came through that way, doesn't it just give you a lift? Oh, it's great. Yeah, I love it. Yeah, I do too. So thank you to those who have reached out and to those who will be reaching out. Thank you to uh, you, Cindy, for being our leader through uh, the books of Neville Goddard. My pleasure. Thank you to our live stream listeners and to, of course, our podcast listeners as well. And we will see you all next time here on LOA Today. Goodbye, everyone. Bye, everyone.